Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, raise your hands if you can't hear me. I will try and leave time for questions and to share stories at the end, because here we are in a story-rich environment of people who love history and who know Northern Kentucky and probably will recognize the names and recognize some of the places and the history, especially big venues like the Supper Club and the Lookout House and all of these great things out of Northern Kentucky's past, so, uh, and also Cincinnati. So uh, with no further ado, let's get started because there's so much to cover here. Uh, what we're going to talk about here is a history of the mob in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky. Uh, this may come as a surprise or maybe not, but um, the government did not invent organized crime, but they perfected it. <laughs> and, uh, and like most things the government does, they made it much worse. So uh, the organized crime, the Sicilian mob, was really confined to the East Coast and Chicago and parts in the West Coast. But it wasn't a national network until the Volstead Act in 1920 that outlawed liquor and beer and wine. Now picture yourself in the Depression, and you don't have a job, you don't have any hope, you're starving, and your kids are starving, and you can't even get a beer. People didn't like that. Um, and obviously, <laughs> We want our beer. And uh, the Volstead Act was repealed, but by the time it was repealed, those 13 years created a huge window of opportunity for organized crime. It also created the cottage industry of liquor production known as moonshining, which really didn't exist, exist until Prohibition. So this guy was not only the king of the bootleggers in Newport and Cincinnati, but he was the king of the bootleggers nationwide, George Remus. You may have heard stories about him, his lavish parties where he would give uh, ladies at Christmas, they would get to their uh, dinner spot and they'd have on their plate a diamond, a huge diamond ring. And under the plate for the gentleman would be the keys to a new car. He made so much money, it was unbelievable. He said, I haven't bribed everybody in Cincinnati and Newport, but I've darn near tried. So. Um, and this is a picture of one of the guys who was a member of the George Remus gang. His name was Pete Schmidt. Uh, I figure if I ever want to go as a gangster for Halloween, I'm going to try and look like Pete Schmidt here. <laughs> Doesn't he look like your classic uh, 1930s gangster? Is he the one on the left or right? Yeah, that's a good question. A <laughs> great question. He gets it. So Pete Schmidt isn't there being arrested. No, he's giving orders to the Newport police because Pete was one of the savvy guys who knew that George had the whole infrastructure of corruption in place in Northern Kentucky. It was a lot easier for, for George to bribe everybody in Newport than it was to bribe all those people in Cincinnati. So he had the, the police, the police chief, the sheriff, the sheriff's deputies, the prosecutors, the judges, the council members, everybody. Uh, he had corruption in place. And when George went to prison, Pete and his gang said, hey, we can uh, take advantage of that. So he opened this place, the Beverly Hills Country Club. This is a, the way it looked. In the 1930s, it was already one of the finest clubs in the Midwest. It was certainly the finest in our region, and it was known as the showplace of the nation. All of the big acts, including uh, Ozzie and Harriet, and Dean Martin got his start here as a dealer. Uh, he's got his start with Jerry Lewis working the clubs in Newport and Frank Sinatra and all of these people. Uh, if you heard uh, Bob Webster's presentation earlier about how it was not unusual to see Dean Martin or Frank Sinatra on the streets in, in Newport, this is why. Uh, they were all regulars here. And uh, they, it was just a fantastic, it was known as what was called a carpet joint because it was clean, it was professional, it had actual carpets, not sawdust floors. And that was opposed to the bust-out joints, which were so-called because you didn't get out of there till you were busted, one way or another. And those were crooked. These were still crooked, but not quite as bad. This is what it looked like on the inside. Now picture that even today, that would be a pretty attractive place. You can picture this at the downtown Hilton or Cincinnatian uh, or one of the finer hotels. And uh, yet this is in the 1930s and it was so pretty that uh, what happened is, let me back up a little bit on the history of organized crime. In the 1920s, when Al Capone was having raging uh, turf wars that resulted in the Valentine's Day Massacre, 
too much public attention was drawn to organized crime and it was making all the mob bosses in New York, New Jersey, Boston, and Cleveland nervous. So they got together and had a summit and they divided the country into franchises. And the Cleveland Four Mob, also sometimes called the, the Silent Syndicate, was given the Midwest Territory of Michigan, Ohio, and Kentucky. The big boss of the Cleveland Four is a guy named Mo Dallitz. He came down and saw this and saw what a cash cow it was and how beautiful it was, and he said, hey, this is in my territory. And he made an offer to Pete Schmidt. He said, um, I'll buy you out or I will burn you out. Well, Pete was a tough guy, and he didn't know that that's an offer you can't refuse because the godfather hadn't been made yet. So, uh, But he uh, decided, no, you're not doing anything with me. I'm, I'm staying. Sure enough, the first fire in 1936 happens. They send uh, a gang of guys in to burn the club late at night. Only what happened is there was a five-year-old girl in the club who was the sister of the, the wife of the caretaker who was staying there. And she suffered terrible burns and then was killed also, had uh, severe injuries from the fall out of a second story window while the caretaker and his wife managed to jump out with uh, sprained ankles and so forth. The little girl died later in the hospital. She was the first casualty on the hilltop in Southgate. These are the guys that did it. Uh, Dave Whitfield on the left, uh, I've since learned from re reliable information, was paid $100,000 to burn that club. Uh, the guy on the right was uh, Edwin Garrison. He was known as the uh, human adding machine because he was a mathematical genius. He could add up the numbers on boxcars as they went by, sitting at a railroad crossing and give you an accurate total uh, of their seal serial numbers as the train passed. He was that good. When he was found uh, writhing in an attic, ag um, attic in Newport with a very bad fever because he had been burned when he set the fire in the basement, uh, he had severe burns, and he was uh, shouting, I never killed a child before. Well, he went to prison. He, once, he later became uh, one of the very few repeats on the FBI's most wanted list. Uh, he was on there three times. So he got around. Uh, Dave Whitfield got out of prison, served his time, got his $100,000 from the mob, and was immediately appointed as manager of the Latin Quarter, which was a mob casino. Meanwhile, here's Mo Dallitz on the right, the Cleveland boss. And this guy on the left is the chairman Estes Kefauver, a senator from Tennessee who ran what was called the Kefauver Commission. The Kefauver Commission was a fantastic entertainment and political event. He went around to 60 cities and the TV was in its infancy. Nobody really knew what was gonna happen with television, but this was the first big nationally watched event. So they would bring these mobsters in, like Mo Dallitz, and they would grill them and uh, put them under oath and, and get all the testimony they could. And what they did is they peeled back the cover on this national network that had been created by Prohibition. And here the Time Magazine cover shows it like an octopus with prostitution, bootleg liquor, uh, police corruption, racetracks, drugs, uh, gambling, you name it, everything. And the mob was everywhere. People couldn't believe it. The nation was so fascinated with these Kefauver Commission hearings that workplaces sometimes came to a stop because people would gather around a radio or a TV to listen, and people would have cocktail parties in the evening to watch these presentations, these um, hearings on their TVs at night. So it was the first time America really woke up to organized crime. Mo Dallitz was the smartest mobster. Uh, they didn't call him silent syndicate for nothing. So when he was subpoenaed, he produced a doctor's excuse and waited for the first round to go around and then later came back after he'd seen the mistakes that the other mobsters made. And he was charming, he was witty, he was funny, he had the press in the palm of his hands, he was joking with the senators, and he was almost the star of the Kefauver hearings. But he was nonetheless a ruthless uh, thug. He came up through the Purple Gang in Detroit the Purple Gang was so vicious that when Al Capone perpetrated the Valentine's Day Massacre, he hired Purple Gang guys to do it because he didn't think his own guys were tough enough. Well, Mo Dallitz was one of those guys. This is his hitman in Newport. His name was Red Masterson. 
Um, the neighbors uh, that grew up around him said he was a jovial, friendly guy. You wouldn't know him from a truck driver or a shoe salesman. He was a cold-blooded killer. He admitted to a Louisville Courier-Journal reporter, Hank Messick, that he had killed more than 100 people. He usually preferred to do it with a pair of 38s, uh, but occasionally he would use a technique called the Newport nightgown, and they would wrap somebody in chains and push them off the bridge into the Ohio River. When a Chicago hitman came looking for Red over a dispute they had, Red found him sitting in a taxi on Monmouth Street and calmly walked across the street, and pulled his 38s, and emptied both of them into the guy. And then he dropped the guns, walked away. He was arrested, of course. There were multiple witnesses. About two months later, he was released. Uh, that's how corrupt Newport was. This is an interesting story. Now, the woman on the far right is named Hattie Jackson. She was the madam at the biggest brothel in Newport. And when there was a statewide investigation into Kentucky organized crime, she was subpoenaed and agreed to testify. Uh, she had a black book that included the names of all her clients and the people that were on the payoff list for protection. Well, she began to testify and in walks the county prosecutor. That's him on the far left in the bow tie. When he walked in, she clammed up because that was one of her customers. He was in her black book and he was getting payoffs. Uh, as the story goes, she was put in the, slammed in the Newport jail that night, and they took the lid off the sewer so that her, her cell would fill with sewer rats and left her there all night. And after that, she obviously had uh, reservations about testifying against organized crime in Newport. The, then in 1960, the Committee of 500 had gotten so fed up with the brothels uh, Hank Messick counted more than 300 prostitutes in one mile in downtown Newport. They had, the families were sick of that. They were sick of the gambling. They were sick of the crime, the shootouts, the, just the lowlifes and constant uh, sleaze that this was attracting. So they formed a, a reform movement called the Committee of 500, and they recruited this guy, George Ratterman, to run for sheriff. George was a very colorful character. He was an outstanding quarterback at uh, Notre Dame. That's his football card there. His coach said he was the best athlete he ever coached, including uh, Heisman Trophy winner um, uh, that he had coached just previously. And uh, George was also kind of flamboyant and liked to have a good time. But he became the candidate for sheriff for the reform movement. He was drawing rallies of 10,000 people in downtown Newport, which you can imagine in those days just closed down the whole city. Well, that made the mob very nervous because they saw that this guy is going to win and we're in trouble. So this guy in the picture here with the sunglasses is Tito Carinci. He was another football player who played for Xavier University in Cincinnati. And uh, he agreed, he, there was a gentleman, a lawyer by the name of Charles Lester, Charles Lester is mostly forgotten or unknown in this story, but he was the spider in the middle of the web for almost everything that happened by the mob in, in Newport. He set up the frame-ups. He controlled who was going to get burned out and bought out. He arranged the takeover of the casinos once the mob had done their work. Um, and he set up this frame-up where Tito invited this stripper named April Flowers, that's her in sunglasses, real name Juanita Hodges. And the deal was they took George across the river into uh, the downtown Terrace Hilton and started buying him scotch and sodas. Well, George liked to have a good time and by his own testimony, he had 11 scotch and sodas that evening. Somewhere around 10 or 11, they slipped some chloral hydrate drops into that uh, drink, uh, otherwise known as a Mickey or a knockout. And uh, he was hustled over across the river, taken up to the second floor of the Tropicana, which was the, an apartment that Tito had, and they had April Flowers waiting there. And the deal was to have him caught in bed with her with nothing on. Well, the photographer who was supposed to show up got cold feet, so they called the Newport police, and it just so happened two of their detectives, although it was their day off, were standing by the phone ready to come. They came down and arrested George, and it looked like the reform movement was finished. They had pictures of him coming out of there with wrapped around a, a blanket around him because he had no 
uh, nothing but his boxer shorts on. And then, of course, April Flowers, all you had to say, you know, that was the end of the story. Well, George was smart enough that he got a blood test and it showed that he did have massive amounts of chloral hydrate in his blood system and that's when the whole thing blew up. The story got so big, I found headlines about George Ratterman in Tokyo. It was a worldwide sensation. Here it is, this mob frame up and it was so blatant. So the public turned, the backlash was huge, but nonetheless, George still had to go to trial and prove these violations in a corrupt court system with a corrupt justice system in Newport. Well, about this time, the new attorney general is Bobby Kennedy. He's just been appointed by his brother, which was very controversial because Bobby really didn't have the, the credentials to be the USAG. And he wanted to show to prove to everybody that he'd be a tough guy. So he saw this story about George Raderman and said, wow, this is my chance to be the next Kefauver. I can go after the mob, and I'm going after them in Newport. Newport surprised the heck out of me. Newport was where the Kennedy brothers declared war on the mob. The first shot was fired in Newport. He sent this guy, Ron Goldfarb, who was in the right on that picture in the middle, and Ron Goldfarb was the assistant U.S. attorney who was sent to Newport with a blank check to go after organized crime. Well, they finally did win the case, and it was surprise, another big surprise, whatever you've heard about April Flowers being the punchline and so forth, she was the one who won the day by switching and flipping her testimony to, to, to describe the entire meetings of the frame up for Ratterman in Charles Lester's office with Tito Carinci sitting there. Very brave on her part. Um, I recently heard from a guy I met who is the FBI, FBI agent in charge of Newport during those years that a few years later, he heard from an agent in, uh, FBI agent in Florida who called him up and just said, George Ratterman. And this guy goes, April Flowers. And the guy goes, so where is she? And he goes, we just found her. Uh, she was decapitated and left in a canal in Florida. So the mob got its justice. And I think it's uh, easy to make a very compelling case based on the research I did through um, the investigations of the Warren Commission and all the rest that the mob was heavily, heavily involved in the assassination of Jack Kennedy. And that this was all part of a vendetta by the mob against the Kennedy brothers uh, that was a result of what they did in Newport, where it all began. And the reason is because Joe Kennedy was a bootlegger himself. He was hooked up with the mob. And he would, would have been whacked on a couple occasions by the New York crime families over disputes if it hadn't been for Sam Giancana, one of the five big crime family bosses in Chicago, who saved Joe Kennedy and then bragged later that he delivered the election to Jack with voter fraud. Well, they now have their boy in the White House, right? That's the way they look at it. And what's the first thing Bobby does? Goes after him. And not only did he go after him, he went after him in the most sensitive spot he could find. I don't know if he knew it at the time, but Newport was the national hub for what they called layoff betting and wire betting. So all the betting that was done on racetracks and casinos and every place around the country came through Newport. The IRS estimated that the handle of bets that went through Newport in one year was greater than the combined tax revenues of Ohio and Kentucky. That's how much money they were making. And here comes Bobby Kennedy to blow all this up and chase him out of town. So they weren't happy. So what happens about this time is Mo Dallitz in the old time Cleveland mob moves on to Las Vegas where they started the first big casino, the Desert Inn, where they, he later, Mo Dallitz, became the godfather of Las Vegas, uh, widely acclaimed for his philanthropy with other people's money. Um, and then what we have here is a period where it was a new boss that moved in, and that was Screw Andrews. Screw was a nasty piece of work. He was a brawler, a murderer, a cold-blooded killer. He ran the, all of the brothels in Newport, and he ran the numbers racket in the west end of Cincinnati. So he was a wealthy guy, but he was a um, really hardcore thug. In this case, uh, George Ratterman showed up to serve a warrant on uh, Screw Andrews for unpaid taxes after George was elected sheriff. 
and Screw responded by beating the uh, Kentucky Post photographer to the street. <clears throat> Meanwhile, George comes out and finds a ticket on the windshield of his sheriff's car by the Newport police. So they're sending him the message, you may be sheriff, but we still run Newport. When George was elected sheriff, he discovered that he had to hire his own untouchables deputies because all of the deputies that he had were corrupted by the mob. In fact, the county um, judge executives told him that they really didn't pay him much because they're already being paid by the mob. Why should we pay him twice? This is uh, Screw Andrews Sportsman's Club, um, another famous night spot and gambling place. It was the headquarters for his rackets. It was raided in 1961 by no less than 35 IRS agents and treasury officials. He went to prison, and we enter a new period in Newport called, in my opinion, disorganized crime. This is when all of organized crime in the country was switching over because they'd lost liquor, bootleg liquor, after prohibition was repealed. Then uh, casino gambling was kind of being taken over by state lotteries. Uh, so the government keeps taking their business. And uh, drugs are still a big seller, but they discovered a new seller. It was porn. By the mid-'70s, uh, organized crime, meaning the New York crime families, controlled 90% of all the adult industry. So if there was a sin strip in your town, and we all know they were in almost every town, everybody had a sin strip, it would be the place where the X-rated movies were, the adult bookstore, the massage parlors, the strip clubs, all of that stuff was owned by the mob completely. And then we go to the Cincinnati side of the river. I'm going to take you over to the north of the Ohio just for a while here. How bad was organized crime? In Ohio, they did an attorney general's uh, investigation and found that every major city in Ohio had its own zip code of organized crime. They had their own mob. So Dayton, Akron, Cleveland, um, Youngstown, even Columbus. And they found out that one of the most popular governors in Ohio history, Jim Rhodes, who probably could have been elected for life if that was permitted, had a tie to the Licavoli crime family and may have paroled uh, Yanni Licavoli, who was a, a cold-blooded hitman, to recover to get what the mob had widely advertised as a $400,000 reward for anybody who could get him out of prison. So organized crime was going all the way to the top of our state houses everywhere, but not in Cincinnati. And there was a reason for that. Cincinnati, you can say, well, they had their playground in Newport, so they really didn't need organized crime. But that wasn't uh, the attitude of the mafia and the organized crime people. They wanted to be in Cincinnati. But there was a guy here. Let's, let's take a look at Machine Gun Bob Meldon, Cincinnati PD detective. He looks like kind of a sitcom neighbor on the left here, um, nice, friendly guy. And then you give him a Thompson submachine gun, and he's an unholy terror. He had that Thompson, and he used it to uh, stop some thugs who held up a thriftway. They set up an ambush, and he unleashed the Thompson on them until they couldn't tell the thieves from the meat department. He, um, he had in this picture, they had two uh, hoodlums, as they called them at the time, were holed up in one of the basements of a downtown business with the little narrow windows at, at sidewalk level. And he said, I'll get them out of there. So he walks over with his Thompson and just unloaded it. He was, and then another occasion, they said that the mob had sent a hitman to take him out, and he put a um, notice in the paper. He said, I'll meet him any day, any time on Main Street. I'll meet him on, on Monmouth Street in Newport. You tell me the time and place, and I'll be there with my Thompson. And nobody showed up. <laughs> Machine Gun Bob, he was one of the first people who said, not in our town. And these guys on the left, they look like mobsters. Those are Cincinnati police detectives. And they're armed like mobsters because that's what it took. The guy on the right is a Cincinnati vice detective, sergeant named Tom Stryker. That was the father of the police chief that Cincinnati had for many years. Tom Stryker Sr. has a very interesting story. There was a period in the 1970s when a, a two dozen adult bookstores had their windows shot out in the early hours of the uh, morning, and they couldn't figure out what was going on. It was happening over a period of weeks, and they, it was a mystery. 
Well, at this time, adult bookstores were moving into all these neighborhoods, and the neighbors would try and go to court, but the, the mob had very expensive lawyers, and they knew how to wear people out and outspend them and just wear them down. So that was going nowhere, but suddenly these places are being shot up. Well, finally, one night, a couple of guys on patrol hear these shots downtown in Cincinnati, and they go racing to the scene, and coming the other way is a carload of guys, and they're in one of the unmarked vehicles from the Cincinnati police. So they tra traced it down, and they found the shotgun in the back had recently been fired. Um, the best they could ever come to was that that car was issued to Tom Stryker Sr., and that in it, pulling the trigger, were a couple of vice guys and a local Catholic priest. <laughs> and these guys had made up their mind, not in our town. And in fact, uh, Tom Sr. told his son at that time, uh, these are the kind of people who hurt children, and I have daughters, and I'm not letting that happen in my town. So these are old times, and that's how they handled things. Here's a couple of guys who also went to war against the porn mob. On the left is Charlie Keating. On the right is Hamilton County Prosecutor Cy Lees. Charlie Keating was the first to declare war on pornography in Cincinnati with something called Citizens for Decency Through Law. You might remember that. His genius was to immediately figure out that the average citizen and the average prosecutor couldn't fight these fancy New York lawyers and the deep pockets of the mob. So he formed his own SWAT team of well-trained lawyers who traveled around the country and they would go to bat go to war for decency in each of these cities, and they had a 90% success rate. Well, this really angered the mob. It made Larry Flint so angry that he offered a bounty to anybody who would kidnap and rape Charlie Keating's daughters. And it happened. Uh, one of his daughters was kidnapped near Burnett Woods, near the UC campus, and raped. And so Charlie Keating paid a big price. Now, you know him because of the Keating Five, perhaps, and the SNL scandal, but he was a warrior for decency before that. He eventually, after the rape, he moved to uh, Phoenix, where he continued that battle and fought for decency and against porn all over the country. Um, and then he eventually got enmeshed in the SNL scandal. On the right here, uh, Simon Lease was also fighting that battle, and one of his first targets was this guy, Larry Flint. What Simon Lease found out, and he didn't believe it at the time, was that he'd had a report that the chief of police, one Carl Gooden, Chief Gooden, um, was involved in a scandal with Larry Flint, and he couldn't believe it. He thought, no, Carl's a straight-up guy. In fact, Carl was such a straight arrow that he was being considered at the top of the list to replace J. Edgar Hoover. Well, when Simon Lees began to investigate, he found out it was true. Carl Gooden and all of his top brass and other VIPs from politics in Cincinnati, we don't know who, were attending these stag parties at downtown hotels with prostitutes that were supplied by Larry Flint. So Larry Flint had his hooks into the Cincinnati police. It was probably the biggest police scandal that's ever happened in Cincinnati, and most people don't even remember it or know about it. It was quickly brushed under the rug. So um, Cy Lees prosecuted Carl Gooden. He prosecuted Larry Flint and convicted him on charges of obscenity and organized crime. That year, 1977, there were two major stories. Number one was the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire. Number two was the prosecution of Carl Gooden and Larry Flint. So you had this, this nexus of organized crime problems in Cincinnati and in Northern Kentucky. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, where's organized crime in the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire? Uh, let me show you. Here they are on the day after, sifting through the ashes to try and the, find the victims of 165 or 169. I think Bob used the number 169 because four of the women there were pregnant. So I think it's a fair number. Uh, this, for example, is a list of all the places that were burned each year in northern Kentucky. And in all of these cases, the fire officials said they looked like arson because they found evidence of accelerants. It became so common for nightclubs to be burned in northern Kentucky that people began to say you could always tell when it was going to happen because you'd see the owner pull up and take all the liquor out the night before. 
So they were getting told, again, the old message, buy out or burn out, you choose. Um, on the right, so you see this list, back to this list on the left, you see this list of evidence of constant fires that are mob related in northern Kentucky, arsons, and then what happens is the day after the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire, we're told, oh, there's nothing to see here, folks. It must be an accident. Why? Wouldn't anybody look at that and say, well, obviously, this is, an, this is not an accident. On the right is a FBI report I got through a Freedom of Information Act request, which shows that a man walked into an FBI field office and told them that he was on an, a flight and he li listened to these two guys in the seats behind him discussing how they were going to burn down the Beverly Hills Supper Club. They mentioned the owner by name, they talked about having inside people, and this flight occurred two weeks before the fire. So he tipped the FBI, they knew about it, nothing was done. Here we see on the day after the fire, look at where the clamshell is going. It's going right up into the front of the building in the zebra room where the fire started. So this is why we never did get evidence of what may have occurred below the zebra room or in the zebra room because they destroyed it immediately. Uh, I interviewed a fire, former fire marshal who said that he went to the governor who was on the scene and asked him uh, how we're going to investigate this. I think it's an arson. I want to... Uh, treated as a criminal a crime scene and the governor told him basically bleep off I'm going to put the state police in charge of this fire He put the state police in charge of investigating the biggest fire in the state's history state police had no uh, fire e experience and in fact as I found out later That state police director was corrupt and compromised and so was the governor the governor was so corrupt, he was tied to organized crime and he was extremely vulnerable to extortion because of his private sex life where he was carrying on uh, meetings with young men while still running for office as the Christian family values conservative. Who was that? That was Julian Carroll. Julian Carroll, still in office Well, he's about to leave, yes. And then what's going on in Cincinnati at this time? Well. Another evidence of corruption. Jerry Springer, the famous mistake where he said, I went to a health club, um, you know, just one mistake. No, no. I talked to the detectives who investigated this. He was there multiple times. He was a regular. He paid with a check. How stupid can you get? <laughs> and not only that, um, it was not a health club. <laughs> It was a bordello, a, a ring of prostitutes and pimps who were operating, uh, operating out of a northern Kentucky uh, sleazy motel. And he was there all the time. Um, so what happened is Cy Lease and the chairman of the Democratic Party got together and they told um, Jerry Springer, we'll cut you a deal. We won't prosecute if you agree to resign from city council and leave town. Well, as we know, that never happened. He agreed to it. But about three weeks later, he agreed, he changed his mind and decided to run for city council again and go back. And he eventually became mayor. So he did not leave town. He didn't hold up his end of the bargain. Um, the detectives who investigate, uh, investigated this guy have a very low opinion of him as a liar. Um, I mean, this, this uh, deal with the, the prostitute and the check, that occurred while he was on his honeymoon. Another little side story is that eventually, Larry Flint was shot in 1978. You may recall this. Um, it was it happened down in Georgia where he was on trial for obscenity charges, no surprise there. Um, Larry Flint loved to seek the, uh, the limelight of publicity by going to court. So, um, and he was shot by this man on the right who was Joseph Paul Franklin, a serial killer who may have killed uh, upwards of 20 people. That tattoo on his right arm is a grim reaper, appropriately. And that's what got him caught, because uh, the, the police found out, Cincinnati police tracked him down by sending out flyers showing his tattoo, and he was caught uh, donating blood. And the one who caught him and got his confession uh, was Melissa Powers on the left there. Uh, for shooting two young men and uh, two young black guys in they were teenagers in Cincinnati he um, Ambushed them from that railroad trestle up there and shot him in cold blood merely because they were black That was the way he operated. He was pure evil 
Um, she got his confession because he had a weakness for blondes, apparently. But she had to sit in a tiny cell with him for hours taking his confession, and her account of that in my book is very chilling. Her boss at the time was Joe Dieters, who has now moved up to the uh, Ohio Supreme Court, and she is now uh, Hamilton County's prosecutor. So all these people have a backstory, and uh, it's all linked inadvertently, or maybe by fate, to um, it comes back to Cincinnati. This guy who shot Larry Flint was eventually executed in part for the crimes he committed in Cincinnati. This, I use this as mainly a, a contrast. In 1957, uh, Cincinnati was chosen by Life Magazine as the model police department for the entire nation. More professional, more advanced, uh, Chief Shrotel was all over it. They just loved Cincinnati and they held it up as it says right there, um, what a city should expect from police, be more like Cincinnati. Well, you just advance the clock a few years ahead and look at what happens after Larry Flint comes to town and then we have the biggest police scandal in history. This is just evidence of what happens when organized crime comes into your community and it usually doesn't come by accident, it comes because we invite organized crime, because we want our forbidden fruit. We want the bootleg liquor. We want the casinos. We want the drugs. We want the prostitution. We want all of that. So people want their, their things that they, they think are harmless, but eventually you find out that this creeping cancer of corruption has infested your whole society. So that's the end of that story, and I would be glad to uh, reserve some time now for uh, questions, comments, stories you may have. Yes? Uh, in your research, did you ever come across information about the court of Chacanero that's been foster prisons in Kentucky? That uh, apparently, um, my stepmother, Torn Henderson, and she told me that she understood just from oral history that that was kind of a, uh, a club that was built by the Midwest. Oh, really? Oh, I believe it. Really? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the corruption was everywhere. For example, there's a story about the town marshal in Wilder, uh, Big Jim. Big Jim was the marshal, but he was also the owner of the biggest brothel in the county. It had secret rooms, it had uh, beds that were wired with tape machines, and he would invite, uh, the, he instructed the ladies that worked there to ask a few key questions, like where are you from, and do you have a family, and what's your address, where do you work? And, and meanwhile, he would be taping all this stuff, and when these guys went back home to Dayton or Columbus or wherever they came for a convention, he'd call them up a few weeks later and play the tape. And they, of course, were glad to pay any price to get their hands on that tape. Uh, he was a bad case, too. He eventually was forced out of business, he said, by Mr. Big. And when he started to testify, the judge in Newport uh, gaveled the hearing shut and pushed all the press out of the room so that they could uh, keep this from the public. Well, it turns out Mr. Big was Mo Dallitz. So the Cleveland mob was everywhere. They owned all of uh, Newport and Northern Kentucky, pretty much wherever they pleased, they had the Beverly Hills Country Club, then the Supper Club, and um, River, Downs. River Downs. Yeah, the story behind that is very interesting. Dutch Schultz was the guy who had it first, and then the mob moved in and took it from him by whacking him. <laughs> yes? Do you think the downtown present-day casino is run by the mob? You know, those companies, Harrah's, Bally, all that, it's, um, it's so sanitized now, but you gotta remember the history of Vegas is steeped in organized crime. I would say Vegas is still, although uh, it has a fancy wrapping on it now, is still steeped in organized crime. Let's not forget, they, they don't leave a business for nothing. Um, so I would say, yeah, I would say that there are connections. I remember when, um, <laughs> well, I'm going to um, offer $50 to whoever wants to start my car when I go today. 
So um, the interesting thing about that is um, I remember back in the um, mid-90s when there was a push for casino gambling going on, and we had these gentlemen come in from Harrah's to talk to us about all the benefits of uh, casino gambling, and they were mob people. I mean, we just, we just knew. I mean, it, it's just like, come on, this is, you guys are in that business for a reason because you basically control it and you can take any skim you want. And um, I suppose they've cleaned it up a little bit, but one of the interesting things is when I did a Freedom of Information Act request to something called the FBI Vault, you, it's like a combination. You plug in keywords. So I put in things like Modal, that's Beverly Hills, um, Newport, all these different terms, Kennedy, this and that. So they sent me three compact disks packed with information. And in that information of all this formerly classified FBI informa uh, documents, was transcripts of wiretaps that Bobby Kennedy illegally made without a warrant in the Desert Inn where Mo Dalitz was running the mob. And he caught all of these long conversations about buying tomatoes and what's going on in the casino. But among those were things like discussing how um, somebody ought to whack Bobby Kennedy. And the other guy goes, uh, no, if we kill Bobby, Jack's going to come after us with everything he's got. We just killed Jack. Kill the head, the body's gone. Pretty, uh, pretty chilling. And in that was all kinds of evidence about what they were doing. The Desert Inn, although Mo Dallas claimed he didn't have any ownership, the Beverly Hills Country Club at the time was using cocktail napkins and poker chips that said Desert Inn. So there was a clear connection. Is this Mo character you're talking about in here based on the one in Godfather 2 that is shot in the barber shop called Mo? Uh, no, that would have been, um, uh, what was his name, Big Al. Um, he was a, a famous barber shop hit job. And the connection to Cincinnati there is that his son came to Cincinnati and set up one of the biggest heroin rings in the, in the Midwest after his father was shot. So we did have a New York mob in Cincinnati for quite a while. Um, but the interesting um, movie connection that's sort of like that is, okay, there was a guy named Gilbert the Brains Beckley. And when they had the capital of layoff betting in Newport, he was the odds maker who knew the odds so well he could make sure they didn't lose money. He was such a good odds maker that the NFL hired him for a while to detect when games were being thrown or rigged because he could tell who should win and how. Well, Gilbert the Brains Beckley was the mentor to a guy named Lefty Rosenthal. Lefty Rosenthal was played by Robert De Niro in Casino. So that whole story of Casino is based on actual people. And again, you get this tie back to Newport. Yes. Wow. Oh, yeah. lot of interesting names like Sleep Out Louie and Big Porky and Little Porky and Game Boy Miller, all these Red Masterson, all these really colorful Screw Andrews. I mean, they did the great mob names. Yeah. <laughs> well, he got that nickname supposedly because they done these all night poker games. Um, he would play 24, 48 hours at a stretch and at moments he'd just say, I'm going to sleep out this one. So he jump, take off for three or four hands, go lay down, get a cat nap, come back, and they called him sleep out. 
Um, the interesting thing about all those people who were uh, e e evacuating Newport for Las Vegas was Mo Dallitz had already gone out there and established the casino. So he had the place, the draw, and all of the dealers and bar girls and all the people that worked in the casinos and, and hoodlums in Newport were welcome out there. There were so many leaving Newport for Las Vegas that they used to call the flights syndicate airlines. <laughs> and if you had a job, if you needed a job, you just left, you told Mo, I need a job, and they'd be waiting for you at the airport. Uh, I went to uh, Vegas in 59 as a junior in high school, and I worked there as a bus boy. And I went out because we had neighbors that worked at casinos around here. Of course, they had to move away in the 50s, mid-50s. Um, after going out there, I got some letters from some people back here telling me different people to go talk to. <laughs> No kidding. <laughs> wow. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Your life might have been very different. It's <laughs> just amazing what was going on at that time, how involved everybody was. Yeah. When we first got there to the club and we were working, there were people who would come in that worked for the club, and they would say, where are you from? We'd say, Cincinnati. And uh, they said, oh, do you know so-and-so over in Newport? Or do you know this over in Northern? <laughs> That's great. Um, when I moved here in 92, um, there was a uh, helicopter weatherman. I was working for the Tucson paper. He called me up and he says, I just got one word for you for Cincinnati. I said, what's that? He goes, Newport. <laughs> I had no idea what he was talking about, but apparently he had a really good time in Newport once. And I'm kind of like, later on I realized, I went, oh, dang, I'm married. You know, I got children. I'm not... I'm not hanging out in Newport. Besides, by then, 92, it was pretty sleazy. That was the, the sin strip age. And I think, too, I should point out, Newport gets, doesn't get the credit it deserves for the battle it had to fight to reform and clean up all that crap. I mean, the, the city council in Newport, it went back and forth from what they called the reformers to the liberals. The liberals were Johnny Peluso. The reformers were people like George Ratterman and the Committee of 500. And they went back and forth in this tug of war. And the reformers went to the US Supreme Court several times to fight to try and enforce decency ordinances in Newport for these strip clubs. At one time, there were 17 strip clubs on Monmouth Street. And the Newport City Council would pass an ordinance that said, uh, you know, these strategic body parts as listed below must be covered. So the next night they send somebody out and the, the dancers now have transparent band-aids on. You know, it was just a constant cat and mouse game and uh, a lot of legal battles. So I really, um, in my book, I try to give a lot of credit to the leaders of Newport who had to win an uphill battle to show people that there was a better future that didn't involve casinos and bust out joints and, and mobsters. Any others? Yes. Did you uh, come across uh, Jerome Restus in your... Who is that again? Jerome Restus. No. He owned, um, he was a horse guy originally, but he did run a few, um, they call them pool halls, they're very <laughs> pools, right? He uh -huh. did arrests for that, but he's a very kind of guy, a really good horse trainer, he had a derby winner and some other really good race horses, and he ended up owning parts of the tracks all over the country. Wow. Going way back. Yeah, way back. I mean, he, I mean, he, uh, he died in the 40s or 50s, so he was really active early. Well, there's just some amazing stories. This is one of the reasons I love this. Uh, I love the research. I love the writing most of all. But my third choice of what I love most about publishing a book like these is to get into places like this and hear your stories and memories of what happened and all these connections. I learned so much that way. I mean. I'm always like, boy, if I'd only talked to you before I wrote the book, it would have been so much better. But uh, unfortunately, the publishing date comes, and yes?
Wow. Wow. That would be so neat to get that on the record. Wow. Well, the, the story, as you know, is that he was in, uh, in the hospital on the second floor, and the nurses said these two big guys in suits came up and told him all to take a break. And the next thing he knows, uh, Screw had flown out the window three stories down to his death in the parking lot. And um, the problem, as best I could de determine, was that Screw was uh, experiencing the early stages of dementia, and that's why he was in the hospital. And I think that the mob got very nervous about what Screw might say uh, or what he could reveal because he knew so much. And, uh, I mean, he had a, a horrible vendetta against George Ratterman. Uh, the two just went to war. I, I mean, it was pretty amazing. I got a chance to interview George Ratterman just before he died. He was living in Centennial, Colorado, where he moved after he left Newport. And I asked him about some of this stuff and um, how scared were you? And he goes, plenty, plenty. Um, we had a lot of near, you know, calls about people trying to shoot us up and kill me and attack my family. And so it was, it was a really rough time. Not an easy time to, to weed those people out. Did you ever come across a Joe Berman or a John Miglio? Joe Berman sounds familiar. Yeah, he, John. He, he was associated with the Yorkshire and the Merchants Club. And uh, I played football. They, they sponsored a Peewee football team. I played for him in 1959. And uh, Miglio, they blew up his house in 60 or 61. Wow. Oh, that might be where I saw it. So what happened is Cincinnati didn't even know that Screw Andrews was living in one of the neighborhoods in Cincinnati. He had a nice house. They didn't even know um, how many mobsters were living in Cincinnati until they had this turf war over the numbers racket, and they started blowing up each other's houses yeah. with dynamite. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, so many people are all like, oh, what's going on here? Yeah. I think somebody over here? Yes. I've heard stories about the role that a Catholic priest named Father Tony Dye played in Newport. Did you run into any? No, I didn't run into that name. Uh, I ran into the priest who was shooting up the adult bookstores, and I did have a name for that, but I can't verify it. So, but when among police people, they all agree that's the guy. Um, and uh, but I did also know that there was a, a interesting battle going on, especially in the 30s, where the reform movements would start up before the Committee of 500. There were several of these reform movements that were led mainly by the Presbyterian churches, and they could never get the Catholics on board. And the reason was, bingo. Uh, Catholics were afraid that if we really go after the mob and start closing down these gambling joints, it's going to lead to laws that would close down our bingo. And so it was the genius of the Ratterman and the 500 reformers who said, we're not touching bingo. <laughs> and that's how they got everybody on board, finally. Tony was pastor of one of the churches in Newport. Oh, he probably had some great stories to tell. Well, I think we're running out of time here, and I don't want to overstay. So thank you so much for coming. It's been a delight. Thank you.